Good, Good afternoon, everyone. everyone. Good afternoon, Good afternoon to those watching on the live stream. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon to those on the room here live. I, I want, want to welcome, welcome everyone to our first um, lecture of a series of lectures, which, which should be presented by Professor Winston Sweet. We, after the pandemic, we have realized that the lecture series that we started some years ago we need to rekindle when we start these lecture series. Professor Sweet has volunteered to deliver our first lectures, lecture, sorry, and we have um, planned a series of, um, in our series, two other lectures for the ending of the year. What COVID-19 has done is have exposed us to the fact that we can communicate and connect with people all over the world. And we are now taking advantage of this technology by not only presenting here on a live room, but also streaming on YouTube. I want to first of all um, thank Professor Sweet for his um, for championing this lecture series. And I want to introduce him to the port to the platform this afternoon. All right, so that is. All welcome, welcome Professor, Professor Sweet, to the platform or the podium. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow academics, friends, and students, the presentation today is entitled Productivity, Technology, and the March of the European Industrial Revolution from 1750 to 2020. more or less 270 years span. The paper itself is the culmination of 40 plus or minus years in the area of industrial revolution and its relationship to economic development and the question of the creation of wealth this paper itself, in its present form, represents approximately 95 pages of work. I promise that the document, which is in this penultimate stage, in other words, the second or third job has been completed. And I'm still doing minor typographical corrections. And I intend to make the document available to the participants here in roughly a month's time. The presentation is made in the following parts. A a review of the anatomy of the four industrial revolutions, the first of which began roughly in 1750s, the middle of the 18th century, and came roughly to, a, to its maturity around 1900. The second ran from 1900 to 1960, and the third from 1960 to 1990, and the fourth from 1990 to 2020. The writer postulates that the fifth industrial revolution in Europe will cover the period from 2020 to approximately 2050. The second part of the paper 
we deal with what I call the innovation cycle, or it could be called the creation of wealth in any given society. The third part is about exploring the productivity concept. That is an equation in its final form or present form will be briefly discussed. Fourth, the three crises, as I call them, between labor and capital and presenting them as a natural consequence or contradiction of the development of industrialization in any given society, but definitely in the European context. Fifth, it answers, it poses the question and attempts to present some answers. Where are we as a society that is both Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean? We must now play catch up. And the paper will briefly touch on what is being proposed as the new educational path. The paper is an interesting exercise in the sense that most of you here would not have been history students. Yet the paper is a study of history, but it is more than a study of history. It's a study of the history of technology and it presents the argument that technology is the basis of development and human civilization. Not something apart, but something built into it. And at, at the end, it posits the position that if we in Trinidad and the Caribbean do not understand where we are in the cycle of the evolution or the march of the industrialization process, then we will continue to make mistakes. The paper ends by dealing briefly, as I said, with the education system where the author posits that our education system in 2022 is as it was in 1960. In other words, in 2022, like in 1960, we will engage in an education process, training people for the place of work in 1960s. But since 1960 now, 60 years have passed, and our education system reflects a persistence, a persistence in pursuing the same education system. Without a change in our education system from kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, and university to deal with what the paper calls preparing for the future then we are doomed, as some say, to continue to make those mistakes as we did in the past. Now, again, what I would like to do briefly is to discuss what I call the industrial revolution. And the paper has in some detail, not only the historical period that we are covering, but bear in mind that we do, I'm not saying that the Industrial Revolution started in 1750. We are saying that somewhere around the middle of the 18th century, certain things took place or occurred. The major thing to take place in terms of the technological revolution was the development of the steam engine. In fact, our, one of our earlier prime ministers in his PhD thesis posits that slavery 
was abolished not because of the Quakers or any other do-gooders, but that slavery had become uneconomic. And therefore, the age of machines meant that slavery had to end. The paper goes on to link that process. In fact, the writer believes that one can boldly say that the authors of the Industrial Revolution at that time, those who came up with the first steam engine, were in fact the liberators of African slavery because it is this, the Industrial Revolution and the steam engine that meant that slavery had to be abolished. I mentioned here in the, in the, in the presentation that there are three crises in the paper. Crises between labor and capital. The first of these crises occurred with the development of the steam engine and the gin, the, the first machine to mass produce cotton. And in fact, what happened was that these bits of machinery, as I said, meant that we had to go to another stage. And towards the end of that first industrial revolution, we saw at least three other machines or engines in the early period of the age of engines. The first one was the electric generator and the electric motor it came together. And the other one was the internal combustion engine. What we found in other words is that the internal combustion engine, including the diesel engine, and the electric motor itself meant that the steam engine had been replaced by a more efficient form of technology. And therefore, what the paper postulates is the importance of technological development and the impact of that. So the first contradiction occurred in that early period when we saw the development of trade unions, we saw labor legislation, and a lot all the manifestations of the struggle. In fact, in that early period, we also saw the birth of the utopian socialist movement, where, and, and, and after that, even we saw the, the, the birth of communism and the Communist Manifesto in 1948. In other words, all these was a direct consequence of the struggle of labor with capital, as labor found itself being displaced. In other words, in, in the field, in agricultural field or the early industry, what we saw is that labor, its role became less and less muscle and more and more brain. And this is important for us to point to, because what it represents is that march of a struggle as industrialization developed of the replacement of labor by machine. The early days, I said, was the steam engine, then the electric motor and the electric generator, then the, industrial, the internal combustion engine. These, these four machines meant that if man was to stay in the marketplace, then he was forced to become more a mental worker and less a muscle worker. And that's very important because that was the first crisis. And I said it occurred in the first industrial revolution. 
The second crisis was to come many years after. In fact, it came when most of you in this room here were already born or soon are room to be born. In other words, in and around 1980s, when we saw the birth of robotics, as I always tell my students, if you go outside in the, garage, in the yard, you will find that all of the vehicles that we see in the yard were manufactured and, and put together, not by man, but by machines. In other words, what we are seeing is the replacement of labor by machines. So that the second crisis between labor and capital was to occur with the appearance of robots, robots that were facilitated by the birth of solid state electronics, the child in particular, and later all the sophisticated works that ultimately was lead to the computer, etc. So what we see, it, we are gradually moving in technology from, from, from simple combustion engine, steam engine, generator, motor, etc. And we move now into the second industrial revolution from 1900 to 1960. And what we see now is a new place of work and the nature of the machine is one dominated by electronics. And if workers want to stay in the game, as they say, they now cannot remain with muscle input, but they are going to be replaced more and more by machines. And I talk about cars that, that my generation, all the cars that we had, were assembled and manufactured by men that started in 1900 with Henry Ford on his assembly line. By 1960, by this time I was born, what we find is the dawn of the triode, of the transistor, of the computer, and gradually we move from the first industrial revolution, 1750, to 1900, it's the longest period. And then we move on to the second one, 1900 to 1960. And that ends with the, the age of electronics and the speculation about Moore's theory, where one scientist postulates that what we are finding is that we are now able to pack more solid state devices literally on a small ship. So he came up with what was called the Moore's, the Moore's law, where they felt that technology was racing ahead and that they were able to increase the productivity with the dawn of the solid state devices. We could double our productivity. It was pack twice as many chips on a given space every two and a half years. And people speculated, would we run out of time or would we run out of development capacity? Well, most of you were born now by now. And what we saw is the third industrial revolution that started in 1960 and ran up to 1990. So it overlapped with the birth of the sophisticated electronic equipment, including our computer, mobile, cell phone, and all these other things. And we are now talking about a third contradiction, a third crisis in the place of hope. Something that the trade union movement has not embraced fully that the inevitability of the replacement of labor, human labor, by machine. What 1980s saw 
the introduction, I said, of robots in the manufacturing sector. But as we move on from 1990s, we now move into the era of what we call the, the limit of artificial intelligence or the birth of artificial intelligence. Now, in other words, we are seeking to create a mimic of the human brain where machines can repair machines and machines can redesign better machines. And we are now seeing 20, 2000. This is where we go in 2000. Artificial intelligence had become the central focus of the development. And, um, some people say that those, those schools, universities that had not started to talk about artificial intelligence in every teaching program will be left behind. That also applies to our manufacturing sector, the private sector. I, 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 when I was start, while I was doing this work, I realized that our factories in Trinidad with few exceptions, in fact, had not gone beyond the second industrial revolution. Some of them had, was on the cusp of the second industrial revolution. In other words, our factories in 19, let us say, to 2000, but it goes further back, because this is when it, it disturbed me in the 1980s when I did my first paper in 1984, that in fact, none of our factories in Trinidad had employed robots, none. The best we had was things like carry on some of these things that you have a conveyor belt where bottles are packed in a box. But we were not using robots in 2000, whereas Korea and Japan and even the United States, if you go into a, if you are going to a factory, you would find robots doing a lot of industrial work. Robots. So by 2000, we are in a mature state of the use of robots, and we are now thinking about replacing even the input of man with a robot with artificial intelligence. And I remember one of the early films I saw, and I documented in the paper, 30 of them. One of the earliest films I saw where they attempted to, to, to show a robot thinking and talking was a film I saw in 19, it must have been our 1950, 50 something. I was a little boy going to stand in my those days. It was called The Day the Earth Stood Still by Michael Rennie. I would have seen that somewhere in 1950, 55. They, they have remade it again. It was a milestone picture in that it represented a serious attempt that this person came up from one of the, the, the planets, a different solar system, and was coming to chide us on the sword that we, by this time, 1950s, we had learned to use nuclear energy. And instead of using nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, we were using nuclear energy to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. So soon after we discovered nuclear energy, 1930s to 1940s, we gone off on war, as right now, right now, I am sad because some of you have little children and I wonder what kind of world those little children will be finding themselves in another year or two because the war in 
be in Europe. As Europe is at war with itself, Ukraine, it is already embracing all of the other countries. Well, how is it doing this? People are talking about inflation. The inflation in America is now global. What caused the whole economic crisis globally? First was the virus. It devastated many economies, big and small economies. And before we knew what was happening, we had to deal with our blindness and deafness. Long time people say, when you don't listen, you're telling some child something, they say, put their hand in the ears, and as they say, say long time, they clock in their ears. You don't want to hear. So we don't want to hear about climate change, but we are seeing climate change. Every Jack and John in the road knows that climate change is a reality. We are seeing flooding in countries that are plagued with drought. We are seeing forest fires in northern European countries. In winter, we see forest fires. And we are seeing storms after storms. And we are seeing virus explosions. And all of that is sapping the economy. So the Americans are making a talk about, about the, what this one is doing that and the next one doing that. But the question is that the global inflation reflects global crisis in not only production of food and other goods, but distribution. And we are faced with the reality of climate change in particular and natural hazards. So with these sapping the economy immediately after the COVID was stopped, all countries of the world are experiencing inflation. All, all countries we are seeing and therefore, the argument in this paper is that to understand how the industrial revolution in Europe, and I must say, why am I saying Europe? Because it is in fact in Europe. The modern industrial revolution was triggered along the same the consequence of the steam engine in Europe. And what happened was that the link between New World slavery in agriculture produced the wealth to finance economic development in Europe. And I say Europe, and I mean specifically Great Britain and France. And it was later to spill over into Germany and the other countries. But the Industrial Revolution in Europe initially was in England and France. And we in the Caribbean were linked to it because most of us were here, not of our own volition, but because of slavery or indentation. And the sweat of the African slaves, the indigenous people, and the East Indian Indians is what produced the wealth for them to begin industrialization or the move from developing the steam engine into the electrical motor, etc. And at a certain time, like all, like all things, the, the steam engine ran its course and it could take the platform for industrialization no further and Europe turned straight onto um, the, 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 the internal combustion engine, et cetera, and later even to the, 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 the nuclear energy. So the paper goes on, and I, I will give you a little part because recently I was engaged in a discussion on one of the chat sites. And when I heard what some of my, because this is a big debate. When I was talking about the 
in the development of, of wealth. One of my learned friends in Trinidad, an eminent economist banker, he told me the men of mine, I suppose he meant smart men, educated men, the entrepreneurs who take risk create wealth. And I said to myself, not even the European father, Adam Smith, in his book, Great Book in 1776, who talked about the wealth of nations, would have accepted that. I had to confront the gentleman, he's an economist, I am not. And I told him that what he said will not be accepted in any of the centers of, of economic learning, either the Sorbonne, Oxford or Cambridge, will agree with him now. They may have a, a wanted to say things like that, but they would not agree with them now because it poses a question. If it is that only those who take risk, the entrepreneurs create wealth. I ask him, did the, did the slaves create wealth? He had no answer. Did the indentured Indians in Trinidad create wealth? Did the workers in Europe create wealth? I'm saying to myself, he answered by telling me, and I copied this book on my phone. Academics do not create wealth. He was felt in short, I tell you I'm not ashamed. So he, he told me, academics do not create wealth, my friend. And he pointed out the people who made wealth. And he told me, Steve Jobs create wealth. Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Jess Bezos, and Jack Ma, and Anthony Sapper, and I told him I'm sad. I'm sad that he is supposed to be an educated person making a statement like that, that those people who take risk create wealth. I am saying what he is exposing is an old theory that justifies what people call the 1%. In other words, those who are the millionaires are creating wealth. And the rest of us, including intellectual workers, you admit that intellectual workers create theories, etc. cetera. And, and he went on in that vein, I asked him, did the African enslaved create wealth? Did the serfs in England create wealth? Did the workers create wealth? I call this a great conspiracy. A great conspiracy so that those who took risk can appropriate all the wealth and say that they created it. And the rest of us do nothing. I call it a great conspiracy. And I want to make the point that this is not an emotional point. This is supported by the history of the Industrial Revolution. Because in the early days, those who owned land in England owned wealth. And by extension, since they owned the land, and the serfs who squatted on the land didn't create wealth. And when they change from serfdom to slavery, the same theory they applied. That is, the risk takers, the owners of the plantations, they created it. And the slaves did not create it. And therefore, this theory justifies, even at present, when governments, for instance, we saw a turbulence in the English politics just last week. Some of us may not have followed it. But in fact, the woman who was just replaced after a few days had campaigned on the ground that she will reduce taxes of the wealthy 
because of the theory that the risk takers create wealth and that you need to let them enjoy more profit and they will save the economy. But she didn't last um, long. And the replacement had to be a person whose theory for the path forward for England had to be less aggressive in terms of that great conspiracy. So I talked about the great conspiracy and my, my equation, the equation, the equation that I developed here, where I looked over the years at the, the various factors, I developed this equation. I remember in 1982, when George Chambers became prime minister, one of the first things he did was to set up a productivity council. This was, in a sense, one of the, the, the triggers for me getting involved in looking at, at the industrialization and, and development like that. He set up this committee and he blamed the workers and workers' productivity for our low productivity, which is typical. In other words, whenever we hear about productivity discussion, first is low productivity or laziness of workers, and therefore they're asking for more money. But inevitably, workers are going to be laid off. That's in March of time. As machine replace man, we need less man, and the men that we need have must not be muscle input, but brain input. And part of the crisis we have in Trinidad now is that our population is not educating themselves to be in the new stage of industrialization. So, that was, that was, um, I, I, I showed you or talked to you about the crisis, the three main crises in, in, that, that are, they are inevitable. And that labor is engaged in a fight that it cannot win. It cannot win. And I started to tell you all about that film, The Day the Earth Stood Still. But I, I listed more than 30 films where one of the, the, the main ones was Arthur C. Clarke's. 2000 and what is this? It was 2001, a space odyssey. Then he did one 2010, and then somebody else did, or he said the 2060, in order attempting to look in the future. And I also remember recently, recently, meaning in the last four years, and I suppose just before COVID, there was a film that came out called. Either the voyages or the travelers. And it was a film in which, just like what Elon was talking about here right now, the, the civilization here was, was grinding to a halt and we had to find a place to go. So the idea was that they built the spacecraft and packed it up with people who were to go and set up residence like the Venezuelans coming to America. They, are, they were going on this raft, you have to call it, to ark, go from the biblical thing. And what happened was that all the people, thousands of people who were selected to go to this new world were put in a sleep. They were put in a sleep and there was no human being awake. So the ship was working automatic, more sophisticated things. And then what has something happened? And one of the pieces of machinery, the cryogenic material, where one this the gentleman, the star boy was lying in, malfunctioned. And he woke before 
In fact, that journey was to take them 80 years. So the people there would be put in, in, in suspended ammunition for 80 years. And everything was automatic. And he woke up. And the problem now is he is about 25, 40 years. So that is very likely that he will die before they reach. And when he woke up, he saw there was a bar and a man in the bar. So he used to go and talk to the man in the bar and he would drink and talk. The man in the bar was a robot. And he was talking about, to this robot, how about his predicament. And he was worried because he was tempted to go and wake up somebody else to keep his company because he's seen 40 or more years of him alone on the ship and the robot. And he agonized over it and one day he decided he saw this lovely young lady asleep, sleeping her eight years. So at the end of the eight years, she would awaken a new thing and be part of the new civilization. And when I woke up, when I woke up, of course he told her that something malfunctioned. And in fact, he went back to sleep, wanting company. It is the agony of living long and the question about replacement of man by machines. This is one of the latest of the films in the history. The number of them that I, over the years, have found interesting. They deal with different aspects of, of, of longevity, of the inevitable development of, of mankind and technology, and where are we going? But uh, so much for that, and the, and the realm of, of, the, of the films that we have to address this. But the issue that I pointed out here in looking at the data and, uh, is that the first industrial revolution lasted about 150 years from, from 1750 roughly to 1900. The second one lasted 60 years, you know, with this time. And the third one from 1960 to 1990, 30 years. And the fourth one, which we will now complete in some people's land, but we're still in it, we had used up from 1990 to 2020. There are others who argue, including myself, that in fact we have already crossed over from the fourth industrial revolution into the fifth industrial revolution, characterized by a number of things, including 5G. In other words, we are now talking about smart buildings, smart classrooms. We don't have to start thinking about smart classrooms. We are the role around smart classrooms. We are talking about smart cities. Those of you who follow the chat site that we are talking about engineers. In fact, there are about four cities in Trinidad that have been earmarked at the government and some by academics for looking at smart cities. One is Tanapuna. Port of Spain, Arima, and I can't remember the, the fourth one. But obviously, that could be Shabonis. In other words, what is a smart city? In fact, the concept of a smart city has been taken almost to the limit by China. China is, in fact, leading the world in the concept of a smart city. Now, some people believe that. Uh, the smart city is only uh, cameras around the place, and sensors with doors open from then you approach them, and all the other things I remember, builders once, uh, uh, 10 years ago, they were talking about hey, what his house looks like, that he could talk to community homes and, and talk, look, I want so-and-so, I want this. And um, the, the electronic apparatus, will deliver changes in temperature, lighting, security, and all these things. 
But if you all were to follow Elon Musk, Elon Musk, in fact, is not only postulating going to Mars, but he's pointing out the inevitability. Elon Musk has invested his money in four, four areas of study. One is space that he's leading. The second one is tunneling. In other words, to deal with the transportation problem, he believes that tunneling is the solution. And he has a big tunnel going on in, in California. England was supposed to have a tunnel for the longest while they can't get it started. In fact, the United States doesn't have a serious modern tunnel. Because this is not a tunnel that you go and see on there. This is more like going a capsule. And the capsule, the, 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 the tunnel is, is evacuated. In other words, no air, no friction. And you leave here and you land there, Minnesota, hundreds of miles away. Now, so Elon is talking not only about the electric car that is self driven and self directed. You could see the role of the, 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 the computer, artificial intelligence. In other words, that you could sit in your car and the car will drive itself. The driverless car is a reality right now. They are fine tuning it. But that is not all he's working on the question of the, 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 the tunnel, transportation, high speed, even higher than the Maglev, as we do now. The next thing Elon has spent some of his money in is what he called the neural link, which is a link between the human brain and the computer. And the research in this area initially was about people who are injured in war or accidents or are born without full use of their faculties, whether it is your eyes, your hearing, is your, 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 your corroboration, your foot and hand. In other words, we see, for instance, the application of artificial limbs. It's no longer what you call on a smaller pen. This is where people who are born or have been damaged in war or industry can be fitted with artificial limbs. And the neural link is between their brain. So their brain is linked to a chip, to the artificial limb. And therefore, the artificial limb, what they are saying in the rules is, that bridge between the brain, the human brain, and artificial intelligence to solid state devices, that is the bridge of the new world. In other words, if we are to go forward, that is the future in medicine, is the future not only in sports, is the future in, in all kinds of other things like that. In other words, man does not have to expose himself to extremes of temperature or radiation, etc. Robots are doing that. And the argument for sending robots into space as this thing for man is supported by that. Robots don't need no oxygen, they don't need food, all you put them there and you're plugging it. In other words, space exploration is more profitable and more likely if it is carried out using artificial intelligence and robots. This is the future. What do you feel? Each one of you should feel just like I felt, and I've been feeling for some, that we are becoming obsolete. Homo sapiens is, in fact, creating his own replacement. Once upon a time, we were in charge. We were beating animals. We had, what you call, domesticated the animals. We domesticated the plants. We made them obeys in other words and produce crops that we want. But with each step that we made along the path of development and the industrial revolution, that indirectly we are replacing ourselves. We are replacing ourselves, and therefore, man in the future, not only. We need less muscle, but less men with muscle. And those men that are still needed 
will be burns. Only burns. So if we imagine in time to come, as crazy say, what we have is, and some sports, some um, space programs have speculated about what, what the future and space men will look like. They were the like, plus all kinds of things like spider, they don't need no big arms, or they could be something like a, a whale in a big tank. All of the world in master the physical part. We are making ourselves redundant. And in that equation that I developed, and I'll show you all later, where I, I, I broke down the input, the input into the industrial process where we have human labor, and I listed it as H1. And then we have all the other factors, energy, innovation, materials. And I pointed out that what we have is labor. And on the rest we have here, a little bit of state regulatory agencies where the state comes in and say, you have, a, you have bureau standards, you have different international standards, those are regulatory, and the rest is in fact the private sector. The private sector start off only owning land, no all the factories, no all the robots, no all the ports. In other words, all else in that equation, that algebra of production is about man and labor, and man is becoming more and more irrelevant by his own development. And what is happening is that the world of machines are becoming more and more important in the productive process. And therefore, if we say, as some of my friends would like to say, that labor has to get its fair share, and capital, whether it is money or land, machinery, materials, innovation, whatever, all of those, what you see in other words is, is the ambit of the private sector has expanded. And the ambit of labor has shrunk. In other words, if you try to put it on, on a table and put each factor and say how much should be spent on energy, how much must be spent on machinery, how much be spent on innovation, how much be spent in marketing, and, and you allocate the cost of all those items. What you will see is between the first industrial revolution from 1750s to, to, to 1900, is that the share of production of the goods and services that go to homo sapiens is becoming less and less. So there's no moral turpitude of who bad and who bad. Is that that equation, what I call here, the development of an algorithm has become the master the algorithm in the productivity equation has become the master. And it has so divided up the production process that labor is apportioned less and less and less. And if it want to stay, it better do training and go to training schools and learn different techniques, etc., and learn to operate the computer. And even that is gradually being used. In other words, the portion of the total cost of production is becoming dwindlingly small. And therefore, no matter how good you are, how good you are in terms of, of, of mathematics, that algorithm allocates less and less to human beings and more and more to private sector. That is, the, that is the one of the things that come up clear. That there's no emotion in it. That the march of industrialization is, in fact, as I pointed out here, I want to find the page. The march of, of the industrial revolution is, in fact, the march 
of human civilization. Human civilization moving from a spear, bow and arrow, to an atomic bomb. That whole gambit in the world. What we see is man becoming more and more sophisticated, less muscle, smaller input. And the so-called corporate body or the business element gradually owning all the factors of production. I know this morning on a little story is to tell us about, I can't remember exactly what it is, about this elephant who came by the door and said, called to this, the man in his little tent and said, just give me a little room so I could put my, my head out of the storm. And the man said, all right, put in my head. And then the storm continued. And then the elephant said, let me put my trunk in a little bit. It's cold outside. And the man said, all right. And after some time, he said, listen, let me just bring in my front legs. And gradually what you found is after time, the elephant is inside the tent and there's no room for the man. There's no emotion in this one. I call that, and I mentioned William, that is the great conspiracy. The conspiracy by the algorithm that comes up in that lovely equation. So what I did, I did some juggling and the mathematics, I reached my limit in the 1980s. And I, and I, and I, I organized over it. I tell you, 40 years I've been on this thing. I've written about 10 papers, recent them all over the place, worrying over this issue. What is technology? What is the secret? of technology? What is the nature of technology? And I I, um, I went through this, as I said, and uh, I want to talk briefly about what I call the, the, the creative that's uh, Yeah, what, what I try to do here, I call that the circle of innovation or the creation of wealth. Because it seems as if, and I, and I looked at every industrial revolution, and in the paper I list that, that there are those who who present the ideas, the theory. And in a sense, the germination of ideas led by leadership, the role of leadership. And that it is not enough to have Einstein or Newton with their wonderful ideas, but that you need what I call enablers. This is part of what we suffer from the ancient world. People who say, aha, uh -huh, you see an idea? I think I'll buy it. That is what I have. And they take that idea and carry it into the corridors of power. They carry it. I call them enablers. They are champions. Ideas must have champions. The champions are not necessarily the people who develop the ideas. Often they are not. They are somebody who is closer to the seat of power, who could get things done because of the linkages. And they said, that's a good idea. And therefore, what we find is the enablers facilitate the creation 
of markets. And from them, we develop activities or things, commercial products. And the cycle continues with ideas, leaders, facilitators, markets, make products. And at the end of that cycle, we have the creation of wealth. And the creation of wealth facilitates the cycle going on. Even if you think of this cycle as moving from the first industrial revolution to the second, to the third, to where we are. That cycle I have traced in some detail, pointing out in each case, the technology, the men, the products, and the women. I want to point out that initially, all wealth resided in those who own land. Wealth was in the ownership of land. This is during the slave period and the period. After the first, towards the middle of the first industrial revolution, the building of the steam engine, wealth no longer only resided in those who had land, but those who had factories. And the new millionaires were no longer those who own land. And you know, some of these films they made of you owning these families, you can't remember the name of the show, you know, all land is land. And after time, what if they don't want the daughter to get married to somebody who's part of her factories? You know, the rise of the, of the middle class. In other words, Turinago, these had the name and, and, and color of beauty in the past. And then what you had is the new, new wealth. Each revolutionary cycle brings a new group of people to the millionaires. And to cut a long story short, in the 1900s, 1960s, wealth no longer remained in those who owned the estates in the Caribbean, but those who owned the factories in the world. They became the millionaires. By 1990s, the people who owned, who were the millionaires, you go on online and check the list of millionaires. You will find that in 1900, well, 1960s, the people who were the millionaires were those who had oil fields. Those Texans, I have a lot of films that go to so look at when you small about. Texas and the land, and mineral resources, still tied to the land. By 1960, with the dawn of electronics, it is no longer those who have plenty oil and the wealth. They became a similarity, but the new millionaires became the Steve Jobs. Those who had captured the revolutionary new age of the computers, IBM and all the other companies purely on computers. I, I follow some of the names here already. And they, they were the millionaires. If you go and look at Forbes list of millionaires between 1990 and 2000, you will see their name. And you know, Elon Musk's name is not there because he's a little boy. In other words, from 1990 to the present, one of the few people who came from the previous layers of millionaires was Warren Buffett. He has spread himself so well. And what we saw, you go on the list of, of, of millionaires of the 1990s, and you see a whole new name. And you all of them have their money in solid state devices, computers. All of them, and I just, in the last one, one paper, looking at 
Forbes list of millionaires. And you know what exists now in your generation? Forbes is now no longer talking only about religious millionaires. They are talking about religious billionaires. In other words, what has happened? The rich men in 1900 had joke wealth compared to today. What we have is that the computer age has given a new generation of billionaires. And one wonders if we keep going into the 5G and beyond the fifth generation. In fact, Elon Musk is reputed to have more than $450 billion. And therefore, very likely, that in another 10 years, we will be looking at trillionaires. Trillionaires. Individuals in a society, largely America, who own so much. Remember that equation I told you about the, the, the algorithm? The algorithm that gives them the one percent that they talk about in Trinidad. The top one percent own 80 percent of the wealth that is created. It is not only in Trinidad. It is so in England. It is so in all the developed industrialized countries that what we have is concentration. And as we move on, it creates new areas of wealth and draws the wealth into a smaller and smaller Some people have written and said that this is not geography. It is not history. It is not technology. It's about the creation of it. And how does that affect the global situation? In other words, there's a famous young French scholar who rocked the world about 10 years ago we are about talking about the development of wealth. And he points out that instability, political instability is inevitable because of the concentration of wealth, what I call the algorithm that takes the bulk of the wealth generated in the society and places it in the hands of a smaller and smaller group of people who are in charge of the technology. I am going to say one thing in closing. What it is we must do when facing that picture in Trinidad. The first thing we, I am tired writing, so I decided I wouldn't even put anything about it here. What it is you must do. In fact, I said we must build a catch up. Because we are still in the 1960s in our education. I say in short that the advisors in the area of education are still training people both in the primary school, high school, and the university for a place of work that used to exist in the 1970s. That place of work no longer exists. But that is what we are educated people for. So we are training people, the bulk of which are in the streets, some committing crime, some looking for a place to migrate, some. We are seeing a lot of people who are high school now, you know, gone and getting involved in, in crime. Hopelessness. They see no future. They see none, and the algorithm sees none. In other words, until we stop our education system 
properly where it is and ask ourselves the question, what are we training people to do? And based on that, what are we training to do? We will continue along the path. Look in somewhere in the second industrial revolution, when the industrialized countries of the North have moved on. They moved on. So the heart of what we must do is a radical change in our focus and decide what is the place of work we are training people to enter. But it's not simply a static question that like this is the equation that we should look like in 2020, and therefore train people from that. The question is, our industry is not there. And this is the central lesson that I am postulating for you out of my studies, that the industrialization is not simply machines moving and developing is about civilization. And it's unfortunate that we, we have to look at the Industrial Revolution as the Industrial Revolution in Europe, because other countries had their own unique Industrial Revolution, many of them before Europe had the Industrial Revolution. Some societies had the revolution and collapsed. We look at, at ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, a lot of the, the Indian civilization, Harapo, and a lot of these things that we only hear about. This is where the civilization not only discovered pi, but zero. Those concepts are so far ahead, yet they disappeared. You know all well, that could happen. The civilization could perish. And therefore, the question is, we who are involved in engineering have to ask ourselves, what can we do? Some of us argue that the engineers and scientists in our society must take the lead. I looked at, at some of the tools in that some of the the historical data. And what we find is less than one third of our students who do CXC and CSEC every year pass one science of it. We are in a society where you still have people saying, my son can't do much. He has a cell phone. My son don't like much. So what are you training him as a parent to do? To live in a world that you cannot fit in. In other words, that idea, I believe that mathematics must be a necessary subject for all. I know some school experience will you know, mathematics is the, is the science of understanding your physical environment. Our athletes, and you I seen a few days ago, our coach retired, we were talking about that. One of the reasons is not that certain that, that the other fellas play cricket better than is that they have not understood the science involved in either football or cricket. Sports has moved on. And we believe that the tools that we had and the standard that we had and the muscle that took us into his recovery is enough to take us into the Olympics in 2020. And what we find is not enough. And until we stop thinking that we have a, a choice, a children and the children have a choice. My argument is we don't have a choice. The, the fundamental lesson about so-called 
innovation cycle. It is a march of technology that has nothing to do with what you and I think. It has a life of its own, and we have to get involved in that. We have to engage this site in discussing technology in the Caribbean and what's in our room. If we choose not to do that exercise, we will choose like some of the sites that have remained parasitic, controlled, destroyed by crime and other things. Um, you know, people like to tell us what about Singapore? Yes. 40 years ago, Singapore was supposed to be just in the position. Today, Singapore is related ranked in the top half dozen countries in the world in terms of wealth creation. That is where they are. And we are possibly done in the bottom third of 200,000 countries. So my central lesson, I, I wish I had, I had more time. But, uh, but I tell you, I have been, been struggling with this idea. What is the nature of technological development? I come to the conclusion that technology is what is dominant in the march of civilization. Man moving from the spear, an arrow, with nuclear weapons, is about it. Is about technology. It has nothing to do with bar and hold bar. In fact, in closing, I would like to point out that there are three fundamental issues that I would like to leave with. And if there are other civilizations, whatever form, who are living things on another planet, Another solar system, what will determine how it moves from A to B to the outstanding evidence? That is a fundamental experience of cells. In a simple form, we come cells in a developed form. And how the human brain is the most developed organ in the solar system. The cells in the human brain have evolved to the highest level in the solar system of all cells. That is the first thing. In other words, this is where we are. The second thing the physicists are better equipped to is that all action that we engage in creates more disorder. What the, what the chemists and the physicists call the second law of thermodynamics. And I am modestly pointing out that I believe that the third fundamental expression is that technology determines the march of civilization. And that no matter what planet we go on, technology. The march of the civilization can't be very So at this time, we'd like to take any questions that you may have by watching this presentation. I think I mentioned it to you that, that the field is almost not finished. You represent 95 pages of my thoughts on this. I will try and have that profile and corrective in another month's time so that it could be made available to those 
who are in attendance, those who are watching on me at this site. <clears throat> Okay, so one of our questions, um, they wanted to see the slides that we was prepared, they want to find out the equation. So you wanted to see the productivity equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah. Um, what I said is that George Chambers had used one of the standard expressions of productivity. That productivity is output over input. In other words, the ratio of the output value over the input value. In other words, if you have a, a process and you take these units, including labor, each with its individual value, and you were to put it in a system, the end product, when you sell it, will have a certain value. So you could compare the input value, all the costs of all the material, uh, energy, etc., labor, rent, all these things, cost of that. And therefore we could think of the productivity as a function, as a multiplier, as a converter, like something that converts scattered elements put them together, package them, and put them on the market, and therefore it has converted one set of cost into one set of value. And um, to, to a little more, what I did, I broke down that into roughly about nine different factors. I put land, human labor, technology, and then we came to what we call the business functions, like marketing, etc. information, regulation was, was, was the state regulatory, the rule of the state, materials, energy, etc. So I looked at individually, and if you have a process, the process say of making coffee, and you think in terms of either planting the coffee and the labor and the, the, the machinery. And, and, and then you end up with selling you the same volume of coffee, you know, the finished product for symbol. What you have is a ratio. So that the productivity can, can be seen as a factor, as a function, as an algorithm that takes all the input and practices them together and gives you an output. And it's not very, very complicated. I was mathematics. Too much. Stop. But um, this is this is what if you have that um, basic equation there. What I did is I I, I um, if you divide the top of the equation TS by TS, you get one, and you divide the bottom by TS. What you get is a set of factors, M1, M2, M3, M4, M4, M4. all of them divided by the total value of the series. In other words, what you could develop is a ratio of the input cost of each element divided by the total value of sales. In other words, you are saying labor, that's what you cost to the labor, and that is the ratio of the cost of labor to the total selling price. And I attempted to manipulate that equation and think in terms of what I call a static or steady state relationship or a dynamic state so that the manager managing his company or his organization we look at each one of M1 over the total thing and attempt to, in fact, relate the cost of the individual items to the total value. And what I found, one that started to drop out, is how as we develop the equation and we looked at it, what we find is that, let us say, in, in the time of Samson, 
labor would have been a big factor. But in 1750, by that time, with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, we see that gradually labor was being replaced. And therefore, the fraction of the money spent on labor to the total become less, less and less and less and less. And therefore, it's reasonable for people who own labor to want more, just like those who put in the energy want more. And what you find is that the other factors become more and more important in the calculus, and labor become less and less important in the calculus. So I, I look at, at, at uh, that equation until I, I could go in. I tried to do all kinds of things. I went to a couple of conferences. I went to the Dominion conference and to the Dominion paper. Still, I was trying to get feedback from people. Because this is at the heart of what you call management theory and allocation of resources to the different input factors. I, I got tired because I was getting nowhere. I was sitting uh, uh, my head on a, on a wall. And what you found is that uh, in the management schools, they were telling you, yes, sweet. What you see there is true, that labor is less and less important. And therefore, as he pointed out, uh, uh, Bill Gates and these fellows who, who are not scientists, but who uh, put things together, they take the scientist idea, put together, market it, they can be millionaires, be millionaires. With few exceptions of you must know, all the rest of them are non-scientists non-engineers, they are going to get a salary. In fact, in many of these companies, these fellows who are in the management, after time, they, they, they seize the company and they fire the, the technical people. Okay, we have another question from our YouTube stream. So this is coming from Dr. Ray Fulham. What are the primary courses and training equipment or instruments that should be used should the, sorry, should the, the civil engineering degree program be pursuing to attempt to satisfy the new industrial revolution? So how are we going to equip our civil engineers? I, I, I where's my friend? Did he leave? No, no. I have my own prejudices over 40 years. I am myself learning. I said that science must be a necessary part of primary school. Good? I guess. I'm talking about the preschool children must learn to play with toys. I believe mean, preschool is not a place to memorize it. That was happiness. Happiness and preschool. Secondary, primary school, little more happiness and a little more structure. No exams at 11 plus. Science must be introduced by slight hand almost. Good science and maths. Children must be afraid of maths. They must love. The, the, the fascination of solving problems and the gift that the power that mathematics and science give you, whether you want a career in sports or whatever the devil you want. So I believe that these are some of the things here. But specifically, I believe that one, as a trained a civil engineer, um, economics was one of the points I feel that, that, that when it, I went to some economics, one of the university that. Before that, my economics was my own region on Bumi and was on my own and all these kind of questions. I believe that science students must study economics. They must, economics is important, and finance on the left behind. The next thing is that, let us take the most recent thing. I said, my friend, like he ran away, but he always tell me what I see. I believe that a subject that must be taught in almost every branch, definitely civil engineering, is the question of geoinformatics. Special data, presentation and manipulation. That gentleman was here. He's one of the experts in the country. And I'm saying that is what must be in every branch of civil engineering. The question about spatial data, 
whether it be flooding, whether it be housing, whether it be, 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 be smart cities, whatever. In other words, we need that graphical presentation of important items in us. That is where the future is. I am way behind. I will just help you talk about my children. They will cope with that. So that I'm saying that is one of the subjects I feel that must be planted in, and I said it to people in me, that must be put in the undergraduate program of civil engineering. Geoinformatics is not an option. So you see what I'm talking about, mathematics, basic science, economics. So when we go and we get students get the, the, the A levels one 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 and they going on go to university and don't know much, no economics. They have never done geoinformatics. I'm saying I'm not making things because we're gonna become obsolete because of artificial intelligence. That's what I'm saying. Okay, are there any further questions? for this collective view on technological advancement that we're seeing in the current iteration of the industrial revolution. Just a comment, not a question. Okay, we want to thank Tarun for that comment. Yes, I, I, I want to thank him on the ground. I want to say in closing that when we started this, resume this, just like the open it. We already have three people lined up, non-UTT staff members, exposed to the area, and that we intend to give at least two or three of these lectures in the rest before Christmas. Um, artificial intelligence and uh, robotics. In fact, the, the person who is in charge of this university is one of the first persons I knew who had been working on robotics, Professor Prakash Prasad in UWE. That was the area of research. And when he started to do that, UWE was doing no work in any area in robotics. And I believe I had planned to go and talk to him before I leave the UTT as to take the leadership and organize one of these open day where, where he displays what he has done in terms of robots. In fact, some of your men, one of the first things he did was to design a robot that play music. And I'm saying, what we need is money to finance research and more students in our undergraduate degree who are opting for research projects in robotics and artificial intelligence. That is, that is what we have to look at as an institution. So I will say that in closing, you have been a uh, uh, good audience. Thank uh, 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 you the honor of, of, of listening to. We just have one question from our physical oh. audience. All right. Um, it's more of an engagement in terms of your opinion. So we have noticed internationally a movement where persons are reverting to withholding their labor. They have pulled back in terms of what they actually produce physically. Um, do you think locally that we are lax in how we engage persons in terms of keeping up with international standards? That we accept that things are as they exist and just accept that, or we seem to lapse in a particular area whereby we do not understand that we have specific international standards of food. I'm glad that you made that question because it will offend some people. Right? I believe that the trade union movement in Trinidad 
is just like the prison sector. They are locked in 1960s and 1970s. And that the new nature of labor should have influenced a new area and approach to disputes. And that what I showed you from that algorithm is that human labor is going to be smaller and smaller a component in that equation. And therefore, what the new working class should be talking about is the training of workers, mental workers, not when my father was going to school, that he learned my father, he left primary school, and start his training was as a, what you call that, a blacksmith. Because at that time, there were no welders. The main thing was the wooden wheel and spoke and metal, carts. So he left primary school and went to be, like a lot of my other friends, fathers went to be, at that time, one of the highest levels of the technology, which was making rotten for, 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 for gravestone, creating that and yard, fence and thing. Today, that is not the technology needed. And therefore, the, the trade union movement, I watched them and remember being in England one year that the, um, the Labour Party had the, the, and I said to myself, I think they really in the 1960s, they stopped in the 60s, and this was in the 1980s. Yeah? So that they have not understood the need for a different approach to the role of the That capitalism is not, it's not wicked in sense. Capitalism has developed an algorithm where it wants 90% of the wealth that is generated by it and not for the workers. <clears throat> and that workers are known to be mental workers, not muscle workers. There are two fundamental that the new worker is a mental worker. And if you stay only focusing on muscle worker, then you, you are going to become redundant. And that the trade union movement must prepare its workers for a new era that is not redundancy. So I'm saying that this is the challenge. It is the challenge. No longer blacksmiths and tinsmiths of my father time. It is now mental workers. Mental workers that we should be looking at. And what are the contradictions? How do you get, in other words, the question of safety of workers become more important now? And I tell your grandma, they put a machine to go in the, in the room where you have high temperatures or high pressures or <laughs> radiation, what you want to do. Out in space, they're opting to put robots rather than men. So what, they, what is it going to What does the trade union movement do to stay relevant? That is the division. How do we stay relevant based on the algorithm and the portions more and more of the wealth generated to the entrepreneurs and less and less to the worker. Possibly in some cases, workers have to become entrepreneurs. And this was an early stage I just mentioned in the, the, the so-called utopian socialists of the, of the 18th century that led to what we call all these um, corps. The corps will attempt to deal with that then, you know, you set up corps so that workers now become owners. We have another comment from Mr. Gilda. So he just says that he believes labor will be fighting a losing battle with more and more robotics, displacing laborers, thereby saturating the job market with more and more qualified unemployed people. It's not something people would like to hear. The only avenue left will be a governmental intervention with a universal basic income, depending on the country you find yourself in. 
this will would be what we have to look forward to over the next 20 years. Very good. Well, that's one of your alternatives. In other words, what some people say is an enlightened human being must recognize that labor is being made redundant and therefore what has to develop is a social change in that algorithm that exists, for instance, in some European countries, America and over here. In other words, education is free, health is free. Because what we are creating and have created over the last 400 years is the human body has created this world. All the wealth we have created. It. And therefore, no, it should be done to a different social system where people are guaranteed minimum survival, health and safety, housing or education. So in the states where the president decided to give 10,000, 10, he said, what, not at all, if they win the election, that's only the first thing the Republican not does. In other words, American percentage of the population of the university graduates is one of the lowest in the industrialist countries. All European countries, education is, is either cheap or very low. America, students who have to pay the fees. We didn't have this here, the government is paying for us. But in America, average university graduate that graduates at say 24 years old, has a debt hanging on his back of sometimes 100,000, 200,000 dollars as a loan. So when they reach 35, I remember one friend of mine telling me, she did medicine in the States, and she tells me that she will be paying off that loan until she's 35. So she can't think about buying a house. That is what America is, you want percenter. In other words, what that last question is producing is a social system that recognizes the iniquity in the equation and guarantees citizens all these rights because it is the human being that created the wealth over the last 400 years. What has happened is that the wealth was appropriated by a few, and it's time to divide it up to the others. Very good question. Okay, so at this time, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the various departments at UTT that made this program a reality. So we have to thank corporate communications, TLIS, PMCIS, campus management, etc. I would especially like to thank the members of the civil department who helped to organize and coordinate today's activities. I'd also like to thank Professor Sweet for his thought-provoking presentation. Finally, I would like to sincerely thank all our attendees, whether you came in physically or joined in on our Zoom platform or on YouTube on the live stream. And we hope that you all learned something important from today's presentation. We look forward to you guys joining us to our, in our next presentation that will be held on November 16th. And this will be done by Dr. Ray Fulo. The lecture will be entitled Prioritization for National Land Transportation Infrastructure Projects, a Systematic Approach. So, for, so from our team here at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, take care and have a good day.